Welcome to JSA TV and JSA Podcasts, the newsroom for telecom and data center professionals. I'm Laura Noland, and on behalf of JSA, thank you for tuning in to our JSA Virtual Roundtable. It's called Taking the Edge Across the Pacific, U.S., Asia, and Cloud Opportunities. We do have a few housekeeping items before we, we begin. Our first 100 registrants for today's roundtable have now received lunch delivered right to your door or a gift card, so please enjoy. Now, if you weren't one of our first, hopefully you'll be on it next time. Make sure you register early for our monthly roundtables at jsa.net. We do want to hear from you and make this roundtable experience as interactive as possible for you, so please add any questions that you have into the chat for our panelists to answer. Also, stick around after our roundtable is over today. You can immediately join virtual networking tables for a unique opportunity to talk face-to-face -face with other attendees and speakers. All you have to do is join a table in the lounge area and let the networking begin. Okay, let's get started. To introduce our speakers and to moderate the discussion, please welcome Robert Powell, editor at Telecom Ramblings. Rob, so great to see you and we appreciate you being here. Well, thank you for the invitation and uh, it's a great, great to be here. Um, so I'm Rob Powell. I am the editor at Telecom Ramblings. Uh, I've run into probably many of you over the years. Um, Data processing at the edge enabled by the cloud is critical to supporting AI-driven technologies that are fueling our modern digital world. While North America was an early adopter of edge technology, the focus is now increased in other parts of the world, including the fast-growing areas in Asia. Uh, the markets of Asia, however, can be a different environment to work in, and because of that, the development of the edge in the cloud won't necessarily follow the same path. With us today, we have three panelists to help us understand more about the development of the Cloud Edge in Asia. Uh, let's have each of them introduce themselves briefly and we'll get on to the questions. Uh, first, we have uh, Sujit Panda of BDX. Sujit. Hey, thanks, Robert. Um, and thank you everybody for taking the time to join in. Um, I'm Sujit Panda. Um, I'm from BDX, Big Data Exchange. I'm the Chief Technology Officer and I'm responsible for building out a technology roadmap um, to suit the broader platform strategy that we have. And Edge, obviously, is, is one of the key things that is driving innovation as well as growth in the data center market. Thanks, Ajit. Uh, we have Jack Ding of CT Americas. Jack? Thank you, Robert. This is Jack Ding, uh, Assistant Director of Solutions at China Telecom Americas, CTA, where I oversee solution engineer and product teams. CTA is the largest uh, subsidiary of China Telecom Corporation. We leverage our global resources to provide end-to-end uh, -end IT and network solutions to our multinational end users. Uh, we are transitioning to the next generation software-defined network with managed cloud and edge data center services. So looking forward for uh, the discussion today. Thank you. Thanks, Jack. And we have Wade Chen of Zedo, excuse me, Wade Chen of Zenlayer. Wade. Thanks, Robert. So as, as mentioned, I'm Wade uh, from Zenlayer. I am the senior director of our partnership and alliances. It's uh, it's a lot of fun meeting and talking to people. Uh, really high level on Zenlayer. We have about 250 nodes uh, across the globe right now, probably 300 by the end of this year, and about 25 terabits of uh, capacity that should double by the end of this year as well. So one of our main goals is to be able to reach 85% of the world's population in 25 milliseconds or less. Uh, so as we built out that network and that you know cloud uh, footprint, it's been a really interesting ride, and I'm going to be very happy to kind of share with you guys uh, some of the lessons that we've learned, and hopefully we'll be able to help some people. Great, thanks. Uh, so first question: uh, defining the edge, of course, has always been a rather slippery concept. What should we think of as the edge in the markets of Asia, and how does how might that differ from what we're thinking of it in North America or Europe? Uh, Sujit. So uh, when I talk about the edge, um, you know, you know, I kind of want to segue into not so much about the regions, but what's the kind of use case that you're trying to build. So the hyperscaler edge, um, you know, is is a different power definition and a different latency definition. You know, um, the network edge again um, with the uh, slicing and dicing of the network and the five G coming in, right, is again um, a different kind of edge that we're talking about. 
And, you know, irrespective of which region that you're in, uh, you know, with the 5G coming up and up in front in, in most of the regions in Asia, I don't see any, any challenges on the 5G side as far as definitions between North America or for that matter, Asia is concerned. Uh, the the big difference that we see uh, in the definitions of edge is the enterprise edge you know whether if the north american definitions versus the asian definitions there's a lot of uh, you know changes that are that are evident in the way this is being defined and the hyperscaler side uh, again the hyperscalers are uh, you know driving standardization so when i look at uh, the edge that, uh, for example, if I look at the AWS wavelength zones, right, whether you're in, in North America or you're kind of building it in APAC, right, you kind of follow the same kind of standards. So um, I think the key differentiation that we will continue seeing for some time, um, you know, there's, is in the enterprise side and not so much on, on the hyperscaler or for that matter, the network edge. Great. Uh, Jack, how do you guys see the edge? Um, from a uh, service provider's perspective, uh, the edge is essentially, uh, we think it's uh, wherever the end user is. Uh, more than 50% of world's, uh, world's uh, internet users today are in Asia. Uh, the majority of the population use mobile smartphones on which applications like a short video, mobile online gaming uh, require higher speed and lower latency mobile network capability. So this means our network needs to be able to extend all the way to edge data centers, to edge devices. So in Asia, we are providing local internet, SD-WAN connectivity, and local data center services to empower our clients' IT infrastructure and business coverage to the edge. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Wade, how do, how do you guys view the engineers? No, it's a, it's a great question. Uh, I've been to a couple of Edge Congress uh, or Edge um, conferences, and this is always the first question that they ask uh, because it's so different for whoever the uh, whoever you're talking with, right? In our case, I, I just focus on ours. Uh, we focus on a data center edge. I mentioned earlier we want to reach about 85% of the population in 25 milliseconds or less. The, the only way to do that is by separating stuff geographically, meaning uh, similar to what Jack mentioned. We will put data centers, compute, uh, and then network uh, as close to the end users as possible. These tend to be geographic cities where we see a lot of uh, eyeball networks and everything else like that, right? Um, what you'll hear frequently from a lot of our, our clients and you know people that are trying to expand is, how do I deliver better into a particular country? And then within that country, you segment that into the cities uh, and you kind of identify where the majority of the traffic and the eyeballs are. And then you build up the, uh, the network around that to, to make sure that we can reach those customers. So, so what is involved in actually building out this edge infrastructure in, in, in Asian markets? And what are the essential building blocks that, that we're trying to, to put together in, in, in these parts of the world? Uh, so, you so uh, you know, when we look at the edge, um, essentially, um, you know, depending on what's the kind of use case that we're looking at, whether we, we're kind of looking at an AWS or a hyperscaler as a customer, or for that matter, if you're building it for a telco as as a 5G uh, core, um, you know, MEC point, uh, that that is what will define what are the building blocks. But essentially, you would need the edge has a very different mechanism in terms of how you look at it from a design perspective, from the core data center, because you're not looking at, you know, building up a, a 10 megawatt or, or or a 20 megawatt facility. You kind of the the power density or, or the power um, that you're trying to build out an edge for is much less, right? So if you, the hyperscaler edge could be something like, or a hyperscaler pop edge could be something like uh, one megawatt, right? While, uh, you know, if you're building it for the network edge side, right, it could go as low as 150 kilowatts. So that's a, that's a few rack, right? So it's a micro edge, right? And, and end of it, right? When you look at, uh, if you look at a large city and you're kind of trying to build an X number of edges out there, uh, let's say building trying to build 100 edge nodes out there and trying to take that as as a cloud front content delivery that design would specifically look at how do you massify the monitoring and management of these edges in a very much automated manner right and all of this has to be coming out uh you know at, at the best 
in terms of sustainability and in terms of how you look at the power density and, and the power storage, right? So the building blocks that I see from, from a micro edge piece are, you know, the way you look at the monitoring system and the way you look at the power and cooling management, which is very different from the core, right? And what we have looked at is, you know, we have innovated to build our own patented monitoring system, right? Which writes very well on the sustainability side. We call it as 360 view, right? And it, it is basically giving you a fully automated uh, containerized data center at the edge, which could go 50 kilowatts right up to one megawatt, right? And, and the other piece of this is about how do you build out um, you know, energy storage systems and how do you build renewable into the energy storage systems. So that's that's one fully containerized module that we have built, which can go at, at a particular location and, and it's shipped pre-built. So this piece of actually shipping out a pre-built data center to a, to a particular site is what we see, you know, uh, is, is a measure of success that we see in Asia in terms of taking something to the market in a very quick manner. Interesting. Uh, Jack, how do you guys view from for the edge from a service provider perspective? Or how do you view the building blocks? Sorry. Uh, okay. Um, we see the industries across Asia Pacific region uh, accelerating uh, their drive towards more digitized uh, customer experiences. So uh, this actually prompts uh, infrastructure to shift from centralized data center or cloud locations to include those distributed local edge sites and moving closer, uh, moving those data closer to the end user to reduce latency. Therefore, uh, edge computing is expected to play a key role in improving such performance for better customer experience. So I would say essential building blocks could include uh, the wide uh, developed, uh, uh, widespread coverage of 5G networks uh, and edge, edge data centers, uh, edge cloud and related network, such as uh, SD-WAN connections. Uh, these should be kind of, uh, you know, key elements we are looking at. Great, Wade? Yeah, uh, I mean, from, from our perspective, we really want to look at the, um, as a solution to the clients that want to go to the edge, right? Uh, are they looking for performance? Is it an issue of redundancy? Um, in a lot of cases, uh, what they mentioned about how big that edge is, uh, on our side, they may be a little bit smaller because they may have a core somewhere and then they want to deploy this into Asia. And it's a very fragmented market, not just the network, but the regulations, the language, everything else is like that. So when our customers want to go into that, when we look at the building blocks for this, the computer is essential, the local network, right? Uh, working with the local carriers to deliver uh, with, with lower latency, keeping things inside of that country becomes really important. Um, in a lot of these cases, are they looking to serve static content where they can use a, a CDN as a great option to do that, right? And just deliver that from the edge there, or is it more dynamic stuff, which has to go back to a core database or somewhere else? In that case, how do you optimize that internal uh, latency within the networks? And then the second piece is like, you know, to that local market, right? How do we optimize that and make sure that the apps, uh, the workloads, whatever that ends up being, right? Um, how do we make sure that it works as they expect to anywhere else in the world? Because uh, as you guys mentioned, US, Europe, you know, the markets aren't as fragmented. It's very mature. They can do large deployments. They have a lot of uh, the eyeball networks and things are kind of easy. But once you go into Asia, it's it's a completely different ball game. <laughs> Great. Um, all right. What, what kind of pitfalls do do you see like multinationals put that run into when they try to apply the same kind of strategies that they're doing in the U.S. and, and Europe when they apply that in Asia? Uh, what what do they run into? What, what should they be looking for to try to do this right? Right when they try to deploy edge cloud, edge cloud, et cetera, solutions. Sujit, I think um, one of the key things is how you you know. Uh, from an infrastructure perspective, how you look at power, right, um, and and the reliability of power, right, and and that's a that's a wide variance when you look at the North American market, for example, getting reliable power uh, at most of the sites are very easy. That's not the case in in most parts of Asia. Um, the other piece that we look at is uh, 
how you look at uh, the network piece because every edge data center needs to um, have a backend connectivity and what's the kind of technologies that that you look at uh, for getting that connectivity um fiberization in in a lot of lot of locations in asia is is still not up to the same level as that you see in north america so that's another piece where uh, we've seen that how do you kind of give out the uptime from the network perspective that's uh, that's of a concern the third piece that we're looking at um on as as a big challenge is uh, how do you look at the the cooling piece right and um, what's the kind of uh, when we look at uh, the edge side we're trying to be as sustainable as possible so what's the kind of cooling technologies that you can use um, with respect to the regulations that you have um, within each of these asian regions um, because of the diversity that you have there it, it's a little bit of a challenge that we see in terms of what kind of refrigerants that you're using and uh, you know how you kind of look at uh, driving a PUE, which is uh, you know, to the level that we we do it in the core, which is around 1.1, 1.2. So that's those are the key things that that we look at from an infrastructure perspective when we look at an HDC versus uh, 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 something that we see in North America. Jack, what do you guys see uh, multinationals as running into out there? Yeah, we noticed the uh, uh, Asian countries have different regulation policies uh, than North America and Europe uh, due to different political systems, local cultural uh, and the social environment. So multinational companies uh, should uh, practice caution uh, when setting up their infrastructure in Asia, especially we know in China. Uh, the government might adopt a new data privacy and security uh, laws anytime, you know, and uh, these companies have to meet such local regulations to build up their local uh, ecosystems. So you certainly don't, you know, those companies certainly don't want to get in, uh, you know, uh, predicament of having to redesign their network or infrastructure. So there are also uh, geographic challenges in Asia. Some uh, Western uh, multinational companies are unprepared and uh, kind of overwhelmed by the, the, the big gap uh, in market maturity between uh, more developed markets like uh, Singapore, Hong Kong, Japan, and the less developed ones like uh, Indonesia, Vietnam, and the uh, Philippines. So therefore, um, you know, having uh, the right strategy to focus on and uh, picking the, uh, the right service provider uh, very critical. Wait. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Robert. I think like Sujit and Jack have taken like a big portion of it that they said a lot of good things. Um, so let me go a little bit high level on this one. Geography is definitely a big one that the MNCs kind of run into. A lot of them have one strategy that they want to kind of deploy, they, they say globally, right? In this case, like to Sujit's point, they have uh, maybe high density cabs or they have a particular network topology that they try to replicate across the world. That may not work in a lot of these markets because you're talking about low density cabs uh, instead of like 20 or you know, 10, 15 kilowatts, maybe you can only do two kilowatts. That's pretty common. Uh, two to six is fairly common. So that, that's one part of it. Um, the other thing is when you really look at the geography, uh, there's a fallacy. Uh, I've, I've been doing business in Asia for a really long time and there's always a fallacy that they go, oh, Asia, like US, it's a US market, it's Asia market, and it's EU, but it encompasses a lot of different pieces. You know, there's different regulations, it's a different country, they have different language, they have a different currency. Uh, all of this comes into effect. So if you look at the, the major markets, you have Hong Kong, you have uh, Singapore uh, and Tokyo. Those are the three major ones where you see the hyperscalers deploy out and those are the easy ones to get into. Um, so, and then you have like Korea, which is a little bit homogenous, but it's a very you know, large and upcoming market. Then you have like Taiwan, which is small. Uh, and then you have Southeast Asia, you have India, right? All of these are very different and they all require slightly different strategies in terms of uh, who you're trying to reach, who are the best network uh, that are there. And each one of these are unique. You don't have uh, like in the US and Europe, a very large data center player that covers every single one of these locations. You don't have a, um, a very large, you know, carrier that can deliver everything everywhere uh, equally well. So when you go into that, like Jack had mentioned, you really want to look at the country that you're going into and understand um, 
what kind of customer base you're going after. Where does it make sense to deploy? If you need redundancy, what's the next best city to serve out outside of? Is there international connectivity good? If it's not, then you have to account for that, right? And build a strategy so that you can get the, uh, the traffic and the data in and out to some of your core because we're talking about the edge deployments, so you're not trying to do everything there. So those are just a, you know, a few of the small things that they went through. And then obviously uh, there's more that happens when you try to deploy there. Can you own the gear there? Do you have to like just lease it from somebody, right? Can you run the network there? Like, are there any other regulatory issues about serving content? China is a great example. Uh, they have a lot of regulations about how you can serve the content inside of the country. Uh, like port 80 and 443 are close if you don't have an ICP. That's just one country. So imagine this when you spread across Asia and you have like, you know, 100 different countries. Everyone is unique. It certainly is. Um, what are the actual new te newer technologies or services like SD-WAN, et cetera, that you think will help, will be driving expansion at the edge or are important to the expansion at the edge in, in, in Asian markets over the next year or two? Is it the same mix of demand involved that you see in North America and Europe or is it slightly different, uh, Sujit? I think um, it's. I see that to be slightly different in Asia. Uh, 5G um, is picking up, but yeah, the 5G use cases. I, while I see gaming and AR, VR um, use cases uh, to be there in Asia too, but autonomous cars um, are still, um, you know, uh, or for that matter, the game zoning uh, pieces are still not there in Asia. Um, the other pieces in terms of, you know, uh, that we see in the Asian market in terms of uh, the way we are delivering video and immersive video uh, using the edge as, as a delivery location and interactive video, that's catching up. Interactive video is a big piece uh, in Asia, right, uh, that we see uh, actually see going beyond North America uh, in terms of the capacity and in terms of the amount of engagement that we're seeing there. Um, the the piece about uh, network slicing uh, being a, a big use case in 5G, we still we still seeing um, 5G in is is not as prevalent in uh, Asia from a homogeneity perspective with, within the top uh, five or seven markets that you would want to look at. Uh, so we still see that um, that uh, on, on that perspective they, they're going for very defined market. So if you look at a market like uh, you know, India or for that matter, even if you look at a market like Vietnam, you know, the, the strategy for 5G proliferation is very different. So uh, we see that that use case is also uh, does not mimic the North American market. Great. Jack? Yeah, Suji uh, mentioned about uh, some consumer application and services like uh, AR, VR, uh, you know, these are uh, actually uh, uh, including uh, other mobile gaming. Uh, these continues to drive uh, our 5G MEC de deployment. And uh, there are other things like um, um, for business and IoT industry applications. Uh, you know, we have uh, uh, so many smart technologies, smart solutions that also drive the deployment of our 5G MEC and other uh, vertical edge cloud platforms in Asia. You know, uh, like a s smart uh, global supply chain, uh, smart uh, telematics, uh, and remote healthcare, uh, teledoc. Uh, these development uh, are all related to the IoT industry. And there are, uh, there are also one thing you need to mention that uh, uh, in China, uh, China's culture of surveillance is also a significant driver for edge computing. Uh, and this could set uh, the direction for the technology uh, evolution. You know, in China, they already have uh, uh, use a lot of cameras at the edge for their uh, surveillance state. Those cameras need to be powered by AI and uh, uh, that AI needs to be powered by edge processing. Uh, the other thing is, um, you know, IT departments uh, of multinational companies, uh, they are tasked with uh, moving existing applications uh, to uh, secure accessible locations uh, to support such kind of operational and networking shifts uh, they need a rapid cloud adoption uh, and technologies like sd-wan will be increasingly utilized uh, to help uh, to deliver such kind of uh, necessary application optimization and security great way 
Yeah, I, I think uh, on our side, one one thing that we have seen with within Asia is a lot of the countries have skipped, you know, the tradition traditional landline, right? They've moved into like a mobile uh, mobile environment. Also, with the pandemic, I, that hasn't been raised this time, but I'm sure people talk about it all the time, right? With the global pandemic, you see a huge shift. Uh, a lot of infrastructure that was uh, on premise within the offices and everything have shifted into like the data center space because they just have a lot more scalability. They're building these regional pops. Um, you know, Jack mentioned SD WAN. So when you have a bunch of users that are uh, not all working from home, right? They need to dial into something. Uh, those provide a more stable environment. They provide a, uh, a better on-ramp into the clouds. Uh, usually they're cloud adjacent. And then that leads into the, the next piece. You know, we were seeing a lot of people moving into a hybrid and multi-cloud environment um, in order to support these workloads, right? And then how do they bring their core um, from the edge? Uh, how do you connect it? Do you do direct connect into these clouds? Do you just use regular IP transit between the regions? Like how do you kind of manage uh, manage that environment? So uh, we've seen a big move towards uh, containers as well uh, because that gives you a sometimes a single pane of glass, right? Mm -hmm. And the ability to migrate uh, between, you know, bare metal from one provider, uh, you know, AWS and even Google, uh, however you guys want to be able to set that up. So people are looking at ways to optimize their infrastructure to support the increasing demands, whether it's because um, the performance isn't good for their internal use cases or if their customers are demanding, you know, quicker turnarounds in terms of how the application is going to be processed. Uh, there's a lot of different strategies in order to, to do this, and it kind of begins with um, being able to monitor and understand a, a lot of the issues that, that pop up, right? So SD-WAN that, you know, Jack brought up is a great example. We work with a couple of providers where they have these edge devices that go into the customer side. But usually that relies on uh, regular IP transfer, the regular internet to connect to something. The problem in a lot of Asia markets is between these countries, the international routes are the ones that suck. So you could have hundreds of milliseconds of latency. Just using the SD-WAN itself isn't going to solve the problem. You need to leverage some kind of backbone technology or mid-mile that's going to bypass the congestion that is going to uh, mitigate you know, all of the multi-hops and the routes that aren't at your control, right? Once you can do that, you can cut the latency easily in half in a lot of cases. So uh, those are a lot of the you know technologies that we've seen. Right. So at what stage do you think we're at in all this? So where are we in the deployment of edge cloud infrastructure and solutions capable of properly serving customers across Asia? And how can we get to where we need to be? Uh, Sujit? I think, uh, you know, from from uh, BTX perspective, because we are a cloud plat, you know, we are a, we are a, we are a data center platform focused only at the Asia piece. So our focus is there are two pieces to this. Uh, one is sustainability, right? And what we're trying to look at is how do we take whatever we build on the core to the edge, and and that is where automation is the biggest piece that we see can deliver edge at a cost point which is very attractive, right? So that's that is what we have focused in building, um, you know, our own technology, right? Where we, we try to get a single pane across all the edges, wherever, whichever location that you want to get into within uh, Southeast Asia or the large Asian geography. Um, the other piece is, uh, you know, how do you kind of look at uh, the SLA management on the edge side? And especially when you're looking at uh, deploying uh, a few hundred sites in a particular city, Right, and and you're trying to look at um, you know not having any of these sites manned, right, and all of the power side of the piece you're trying to manage, monitor, and you know do the change management piece in an automated manner, right? How do you kind of deliver the kind of you know SLAs that the hyperscalers are looking at, or for that matter, you know a a, a very very critical application, for example, on the medical side, we look at so. These are the two pieces that we're trying to bring together, sustainable and automated. These, This is what we believe can drive the pace of adoption of edge in Asia. Jack, what, are, what do we got out there? Yeah, I think this is a very uh, challenging question. Uh, uh, actually, each country is different uh, in development uh, stage. So generalizing may be uh, kind of difficult. As uh, one of the... Uh, major service providers in China, uh, uh, we are developing 5G uh, MEC edge cloud capabilities in full swing and already have many 
uh, successful commercial use cases uh, for a variety of businesses and industries. So uh, that's that's how we see the stage. Thank you. Wait. Yeah, this is a this is a great question. I think the um, that that really speaks to what Sandler does, right? This is definitely a gap that we have seen the ability to bring the edge to all of these markets, especially in Asia. We've already talked a lot about how difficult these are and how fragmented that market is. Um, I can, with pretty good confidence, almost one hundred percent confidence, say that at the very minimum, we're the number two global edge cloud company. Um, I challenge someone to figure out who number one is, but you know we have a very large footprint. Uh, you know, in terms of the locations that we're able to deploy uh, these edge clouds for the customers and vertically integrate that. Um, it's been the problem that we try to solve for a lot of companies. How do you enter into these markets? How do you deploy your edge infrastructure? Is there somebody that can aggregate this across the multiple countries in Asia and give you that you know, singular experience uh, and uh, one single point of contact, right? Can they also share what kind of problems you're gonna run into as you go into these markets? And, and even more fun, um, in a lot of cases, we'll do POCs for the clients. We have the network and the compute and everything ready you can get hard data and say, well, if I use you guys or if I deploy into this market, how much of an improvement am I going to see there compared to, you know, oh, maybe we don't know for sure. We got to deploy there first and then we can find out. So that's what really drives our growth and why, you know, I mentioned earlier, we're trying to grow to 300 sites. We're adding 50 sites and doubling our you know, backward capacity. This is the reason because there's not one large player. Uh, that is able to buy this all over the place. And I think we're probably the closest to that right now. Right. As a follow-up, what what markets are you meant, Jack mentioned that you know it varies a lot based on, on the market. What markets are you actually seeing a lot of investment in edge infrastructure and cloud edge cloud infrastructure in in Asia right now? Where's the investment going? Where's the activity? Where's the demand right now? Uh did you? I think um you know, we're seeing um, very good traction in the markets that we operate in. Um, we are one of the um, better placed players in uh, in Singapore. Uh, we we've done some good work uh, in uh, Malaysia. Uh, we are also seeing um, traction in Indonesia in a big way. In fact, we're going to be uh, we're going to be betting big on Indonesia uh, over the next uh, six to eighteen months. Um, we also see uh, China as a very important market for us. Uh, we have invested uh, heavily in China. Uh, we see uh, India uh, coming up with 5G being the, you know, the, the auctions happening uh, over the next two months or so. We, sh we will see that that uh, will play catch up market. Um, and uh, Taiwan, obviously, uh, is another place where we, we see that uh, there is going to be good amount of growth there. So we're, we're going in, in Taiwan also. So those are the key markets for us. Um, but yes, uh, you know, I'm not, uh, I'm not looking, uh, I'm not uh, saying that there are not other markets, but these are priority markets for us. And what we believe is, if I look at the uh, eyeball gravity in the markets that I spoke about, that's around 75 to 80% of, of uh, the total eyeball gravity in uh, APAC. So that's, that's for us is the priority market. Jack, what markets do you see people investing in and what, what are you guys investing in right now? Yeah, for us, the, the major markets we're targeting uh, uh, China, um, uh, uh, Singapore, uh, Japan, uh, Australia, you know, because we see we see uh, that there are huge development, uh, you know, uh, and uh, the money goes to these uh, markets. Uh, you, you know, in many in in all these countries, the government investment in uh, digital infrastructure have been accelerated uh, in recent years. So this is a uh, huge for uh, for us uh, service providers. Uh, and uh, another example for our parent company, uh, they have developed uh, extensive cloud network connectivity infrastructure uh, to these countries and invested a lot of money in cloud SD1 platform development to benefit our customers and facilitate uh, their own digital transformation. Wait, where do you see the feet on the ground right now? Yeah, no, I think they, they mentioned a couple of good markets, right? Um, when we started 
this. Uh, India was a big, uh, sorry, China was a big one. We had probably like 40 pops there. India was the next big one that we're looking at. We have over 20 pops there. Uh, Indonesia, we've actually uh, worked very closely with the telecom Indonesia though. That's been a very interesting market that a lot of people are going into. Um, but where we are looking like further ahead because we are trying to get into more of these emerging markets, as we said, like a global edge cloud. So uh, South America is a big one that we're looking at, you know, going to Chile, uh, Colombia, Peru. Uh, these are some areas that we see a lot of growth in. Eastern Europe is another one where we're seeing quite a bit of growth. Africa is supposed to be uh, very quick up and coming with a lot of um, a lot of new eyeballs that are that are going out there. And then uh, we also see some traffic going into the Middle East, you know, like, um, those are all the areas where we're seeing increase in because we've already had that footprint in like China and Indonesia. We're really looking at expanding to those markets and helping people access them. I'm looking in the questions uh, in, in from the from the audience. Uh, we have one from uh, from Ram Kumar of AT and T. Uh, how do you see hyperscalers and CSPs working in MEC? The CSPs provide edge access with hyperscalers bringing apps to the edge. Anybody have a, any thoughts on that? I'm not going to put everybody on the spot. Did you? I think uh, uh, that's a very good question. I think there is a the the communication service providers and uh, the hyperscalers are kind of uh, collaborating in a big way there, where you know uh, basically uh, the the hyperscalers are bringing their um, you know the compute uh, the the compute in a box kind of thing for the RAN infrastructure on the 5G side. And uh, you know what they get is you know the the site is still being managed by and and uh, maintained from a licensing perspective and from the local conditions perspective by the CSP, while the compute node is brought by the hyperscaler, and and not just the compute but but also the the RAN application and and the environment for the five G is being being kind of contributed by the uh, hyperscaler. So that's a very interesting piece that we see not just in North America. We've seen that, uh, you know, in, in uh, within at and I think uh, you've seen that uh, panning out with Microsoft. Uh, you've seen uh, some good traction, uh, some work that at and is also doing with Amazon. You see Verizon also working with uh, a bunch of hyperscalers. And, and the same way we've seen Google doing a lot of good work uh, in, in some of the larger geographies um, we've, we've seen proof of concepts being being done in Indonesia. We've seen proof of concepts being spoken about in Singapore. Um, uh, there is, uh, you know, I, I was uh, participating in, uh, I have I've not been able to name the hyperscaler because there is an India that we've signed, but there's some good work that we're doing in, in Vietnam. So I, I see that this is already panned out and, and I see that the way to massify the 5G edge is with the, uh, you know, great partnership between the hyperscaler and the CSP. Yeah, any thoughts on, on, on how we see hyperscalers and CSPs working in, in MEC? Uh, I, I don't have any, any comments on that. Okay, uh, wait, any thoughts? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So I, I think we're, when we talk about that edge, right, I think there's two parts. One is for a lot of the hyperscalers, uh, a lot of them have now uh, what Sujit mentioned, the ability to deploy a custom infrastructure to that edge and then keep them within the ecosystem. The difficulty on that is typically these are, you know, very high kilowatt or they have requirements where it mainly can only sit in the data centers. So in a lot of these cases, uh, companies that are using these hyperscalers and want to extend out into further edge markets are creating hybrid solutions uh, where they tie the compute and the network somehow back to uh, one of the cores uh, where the hyperscalers kind of sit. So increasingly, it's like, how do you increase um, the ability to uh, merge these two, right? And make it easy for them to manage. Um, like we said, there's a lot of people that start off in the hyperscalers because it's easy to get them up and spinning. And then they find out, okay, it delivers pretty good to most of the areas. But then when I start seeing more uh, more customers in areas where probably they're not the best, then how do I optimize and increase that? Uh, and there's definitely different ways to do that. And a lot of them do work together in order to uh, get that going. Right. So uh, back on uh, the the topic of you know what's out there, what's not out there right now? What where are, are should there be investment going? Do you think that? There isn't where what what in markets perhaps are not are not getting the attention they should or what technologies are not getting the the, uh, the attention they should is it do you ha anybody have any 
ideas as to what we're not doing right now? I think um, what I see in Asia specifically um, is the way uh, the power piece is being managed. I think uh, when I when I look at the EU and the and in some of the North American markets, uh, the way you do energy storage, and and the way the energy storage systems actually interact with the grid, uh, that that interaction uh, or or that kind of uh, you know partnership between the utilities and the edge companies is not happening. So if you look at it, um, you know you're looking at it as as a, as a customer. The, the power company look at the data centers as one of the largest customer verticals. But in spite of that, I don't see the kind of work that needs to be done from a sustainability perspective or for the for that matter, from a grid stability perspective uh, actually being uh, done in Asia per se. I, I see a lot of this um, in the developed markets. Uh, you know, the, the utility players, and the grid players are interacting very closely to ensure that you know you're not just a customer but you're also contributing backwards and and there are there are incentives that the utilities uh, as well as the as some of the some of the governments also are providing in terms of what what the uh, the edge data center or for that matter even a core data center does in terms of managing and maintaining the grid and ensuring that the losses are at the minimal and which can to contribute to the sustainability angle Anybody else have any, any thoughts on what, what's not being done out there that we really should so somebody should start paying attention to? <laughs> I can share a couple of uh, potential interesting stuff, right? So, so one of them he, that was mentioned is, um, you know, what we see in a lot of these markets is that there's still a lot of incumbents. Uh, a lot of these uh, telecom pairs or the the ISPs are could be state owned. There's not a whole lot of choice, right? That really drives up prices. And in, in terms of the data centers. Um, there's also not quite as many that are carrier neutral. Those are a little bit difficult to find sometimes. So you end up having to go with carrier hotels and that changes the strategy on how you can deliver, you know, into the country. Um, and because a lot of these are either carrier owned or uh, they're you know, regional ISPs that are incumbents there, um, the cost to deliver into these markets are extremely high, sometimes 10x what you would see in US and Europe. Uh, and I think that also gives them a little bit of sticker shock, right? But as you know, more and more people start coming online, as the network, uh, the physical underlying network and infrastructure increases, yeah, you may see that cost start to come down a little bit. Um, but you know, that's kind of where I see things. Jack, anything you wish we saw more of right now in investment in the sector? Yeah, uh, we see uh, still see the content is the is the king for in the in the digital world. So. Uh, software media uh, content companies they they require huge bandwidth, uh, and uh, you know so over the internet we need a very large and fast growing you know consumer market in the Asia Pacific. That's what we see. You know the cons consumption of these media uh, uh, in Asia is a very important uh, for the real time uh, you know uh, in applications. All right. Well, I think we're running out of time here, so I think we'll just call a call it a, a day. And uh, thank you very much for for all your opinions. And I'm going to hand it back to Laura here. Laura. Well, thank you, Rob, and thank you again to all of our speakers for today's insights on the U.S., Asia, and cloud opportunities. Just a quick reminder for you: our speakers are staying on for the remainder of the lunch hour to answer any more of your questions. Just meet them back in the networking lounge and start table hopping to talk to as many as you can. And viewers, if you are one of our first 100 registrants, we hope you enjoyed your delicious lunch. Make sure you visit us at jsa.net to register for more upcoming JSA virtual roundtables. Our next one's happening April 7th, 1 p.m. Eastern, when leaders in our industry will talk about learning from the best innovative new ways to reduce carbon footprints this year and beyond. That should be a good one. Well, that is a wrap for us. Look out for the playback of today's roundtable coming soon to JSA TV and JSA podcasts on YouTube, iTunes, iHeart, Spotify, and more. In the meantime, see you back in the networking lounge. Happy networking.